W-Y-S-I-W-Y-G, WYSIWYG, which we all know is a computer language. What you see is what you get. Although we use it for computers, I think we got it from Jesus. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Every one of us who wears glasses knows that we'll continue looking through scratched and smudged lenses until finally we get tired of not being able to see clearly and moving our face to try to see through the smudge and finally clean our glasses. If there's a smudge on the lens, the world will look smudged. Or to use Jesus' wonderful metaphor, if there's a log in your own eye, you will see logs everywhere. You hypocrite. Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Once you can see your own log, you can stop blaming, accusing, and denying, and thus displacing the problem. You know how it is with pointing fingers. One is pointed, but there are three pointing back at you. We know more about the person pointing the finger than the person who the finger is pointing to. The log in your own eye ranks right up there with Jesus' other all-time great metaphor in Matthew 23, 24. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Most people don't see things as they are. They see things as they are. Last week, we heard Jesus say, the lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be filled with light. You know, infants see themselves entirely mirrored in their parents' eyes, especially the mothers. But if there's something in our eye, we can't see the other clearly. Eve and Adam were forbidden to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Their seeing was blurred, however, by the suggestion that the serpent put in their eyes, Oh, you won't die. Your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Oh, their eyes were opened, after all, but all they saw was that they were naked, and they hid from God. This knowledge of good and evil is about judging. It's about making judgments that isolate and separate us. It's the beam in our own eye that makes the whole world look splintered. And when we see ourselves as separate from one another, we also find ourselves separated from God. Despite the warnings from every prophet and seer who saw quite clearly where things were headed, we stubbornly held on to that splintered vision until, in fact, we actually did find ourselves removed from God's sight. Is that what God wanted for us? Or did we get what our eyes desired? In one of the training sessions between Merlin and the young Arthur, Merlin takes Arthur into the forest and turns him into a hawk. They could do that in those days. And he sends him sailing into the sky from the earth, Merlin shouts to Arthur, what do you see? Arthur responds, I see rivers and trees. No, an irritated Merlin responds. And he repeats his question, what do you see? I see cattle and sheep. And no, Merlin interrupts and asks the third time, what do you see? I see villages and, oh, come down, orders Merlin. Arthur the hawk returns to earth and becomes Arthur, the young boy. Merlin tells him, someday you will know what you saw. The day Arthur knows what he saw was the day after his dream of Camelot died. He saw no boundaries. When he was in the sky and looking at the earth, everything was distinct, yet also part of a unity in the universe, there may be many lines, 
But the lines can be viewed as either divisions or meeting places. Both divisions and meeting places are created by the mind. We don't need to be turned into a hawk for this kind of seeing now that we're able to travel by plane. But Fred Hoyle, the astronomer, predicted in 1948 that once a photograph of the Earth taken from the outside is available, once the sheer isolation of the Earth becomes plain, a new idea as powerful as any in history will be let loose. Beatrice Bruteau suggests that the picture of the Earth from space generates the idea that we human beings, better perhaps we living beings, constitute one family on a tiny, fragile planet in limitless space. The first creation story of Genesis says, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. First, God sees all, and then God sees it is good. That is the judgment God makes in the sight of God. All are good. Jesus is inviting us to see not with our own eyes, but with the eyes of God. Chaim Potok, in his book, The Gift of Asher Lev, tells us what we can expect. My father of blessed memory once said to me on the verse in Genesis, and he saw all that he did, and behold, it was good. My father said that the seeing of God is not like the seeing of man. Man sees only between the blinks of his eyes. He does not know what the world is like during the blinks. He sees the world in pieces and fragments. But the master of the universe sees the world whole, unbroken. That world is good. Jesus' work is to move people beyond pieces and fragments, beyond judging and counting and measuring, because our measuring and counting is always too small. Our God is a prodigal God given to extravagant wastefulness. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord. Annie Dillard, in her book, For the Time Being, a cosmic reflection on life and death, eternity, and the interconnectedness of all creation, writes, there are 1,198,500,000 people alive now in China. To get a feel for what that means, Simply take yourself in all your singularity, importance, complexity, and love, and multiply by 1,198,500,000. See? Nothing to it. Jesus wants to give us the ability to see without blinking, to open the heart to the wholeness of creation. For this is what the heart always wants. You have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you.